The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene and you're listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. With me today, we are going to discuss on a topic that is related to an event that will be an upcoming event soon in November. It's called, sorry, in October. It's called the Emerging Leaders Conference on Redefining Education, Breaking Briars, Empowering the Asia Pacific Youth. So, a uh, lot Pomperada or Lot Leoma Pomperada, Regional Director for World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific, uh, is with me now to share all the information about the conference as well as uh, what will be discussed and the speakers that will be attending as well. So, hi, how are you? Hi, Arlene. Good morning. I'm doing great. Good morning to all our listeners. Yes, good morning. And yeah, it's great to uh, hear from you. And as the Regional Director for the World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific, this is not the first time uh, you guys are organizing the, um, uh, sorry, the Emerging Leaders Conference, right? Yes, that's right. Um, in short, we call it the ELC. And mm-hmm. the ELC is an annual um, project of World Youth Alliance in each of its, re- its each of its regions around the world, and in Asia Pacific, we've been implementing it for the past um, three years. So mm-hmm. this year is the fourth run of the conference. I see. So why is it called Emerging Leaders? So it's for young people, I, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, we call it Emerging Leaders because um, basically the youth leaders today are the future global leaders um, of the future. Leaders in different um, ways, leaders in businesses, in the government, in media and communication. And we hope that this conference will prepare them for the future. Mm -hmm. And this year's team is quite interesting because you are focusing on the main pillar on how to define or uh, how to um, uh, nurture leaders. And in this case is education. So why education? Yes, exactly. Um, we decided to have um, education as our team is is because um, this year we're having the the new goals for the post 2015 right for the sustainable development goals and one of the goals that is present is on education and this is something that we believe should be given highly um, important because. Um, if each young person is educated and at the same time achieving not only education but a holistic form of education, then he can do more and contribute more to his community and his country. Mm. And for the World Youth Alliance, uh, just just give a bit of background about your organization. Um, you guys focus a lot on nurturing leaders through education, right? Yes, that's right. Tell us more about the organization. Um, World Youth Alliance was founded in 1999 in New York by our founder, Anna Halpin. And World Youth Alliance is turning 16, just turning 16 years old last March. And World Youth Alliance is a global coalition of young people. It's a youth organization wherein we bring young people from different parts of the world on um, our advocacy, which is to promote the dignity of the person, and we do that by training young people to impact policy and culture in the community, in the national, in, in, the, in the international level. So the work that World Youth Alliance is doing is mainly categorized into three ways, that's education, advocacy, and culture, and we currently have over a million members from 160 um, countries work together in different projects, and being um, followed through by our different regional offices around the world. So the main focus here for the trends is really on human dignity and the human person. How can we um, develop the human person more that it could help the society at the same time? How could the society create programs and policies that would um, foster integral human development? So oh, that's it. That's really science. Mm, that's a very huge task and very, really large goals uh, in a way. Um, talking about the conference itself, uh, is there any specific area that, that you guys are targeting when it comes to nurturing leaders and uh, redefining education? 
Well, um, for World Youth Alliance, we always start with um, with the understanding of human dignity, and we believe in a World Youth Alliance that human dignity is manifested in three ways. That's through our human freedom, our solidarity, how we work with each other, and last is through culture. And in the three ways, we train young people on a certain um, um, through a certain training program for them to understand more um, their role as youth leaders and how um, is human dignity important in today's world. And that is the reason why we decided for this year's conference to focus on education because education is a very um, very talked about topic, especially among young people. But we wanted to discuss, to discuss and to explore a different side of education that more than education in the classroom, more than education in books or mm-hmm. in education online, what is the type of education that will truly prepare young people for the future, that will truly help them discover their passions or their true potential in becoming um, who they really want to be in the future. So, Mm -hmm. there. So, yeah, focusing beyond classroom education, education that is on the street and among your peers and and, uh, with with society or in reality uh, with the world that we are, uh, you know, experiencing right now. Yes, that's true. So we're going to discuss um, innovations in education. At the same time, we've invited um, young people to talk about social entrepreneurship. We also have, um, since we've also discussed the theme that we'll be discussing, like um, breaking barriers. What are these mm-hmm. barriers? Who are the community? Some of the communities affected, and what are the existing programs that would help them? Um, gain access or improve the quality of education that they currently have. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss more about the top, I mean, each of the areas that uh, the the conference itself will be discussed later in the second segment. But for this segment, I'm quite interested to find that uh, you are actually targeting not just Southeast Asian, but Asia Pacific youth as a whole. So tell us more about it. Like, yes, that's right. uh, tell us why Asia Pacific and what do you see in them? Okay, so in World Youth Alliance, we have six regions around the world. Mm-hmm. So our headquarters and the North America office is located in New York. We also have for Latin America in Mexico, um, in Belgium is our European office, in Middle East is in Beirut, and the one in Africa is in Nairobi in Kenya. And our our Asia Pacific regional office is the one in Manila in the Philippines. And we gather young people through their different regions, and mm-hmm. that is the reason why this is the Asia Pacific Emerging Leaders Conference. I think that's also one of the special things with the ELC. Mm-hmm. So aside from the different speakers, um, we also have um, we also provide our young people with the opportunity to meet their fellow young leaders, not only in Southeast Asia but also in Asia Pacific countries. So we have um, delegates in different parts of Asia Pacific, as far as from Australia and New Zealand, South Asia, East Asia. And of course, um, Southeast Asia. So this unique platform of opportunities um, enable young people to have concrete projects after the conference. That mm-hmm. it doesn't end there. So usually after the conference, we do some follow up with them, and we're glad that after the past three conferences, um, our attendees, our alumni, still meet with each other. It can uh-huh. be a random catch up and conversation, but it can also be as big as organizing their own projects together and bringing more of their organizations together to implement their own projects. Mm. And that's really what we're excited about, what happens after the conference. I see. But unfortunately, the application date has uh, closed. <laughs> um, yeah, it just closed um, yesterday. We're not sure if we're still going to accept um, applications. Instead, they might be interested if there might be some back outs from some of our delegates um, who were accepted, mm-hmm. um, we might consider the possibility of accepting them. I but see. for now, um, because for the conference also, we only select around 100 to 120 maximum youth delegates for Asia Pacific mm-hmm. so that we ensure that they are coming from different um, backgrounds, different countries, different schools, different ages. And it's open to 15 to 8 years old. Mm. So aside from university students, the conference is also open to high school students and young professionals who would like to learn more about the topic. 
I see. So in a way, you you keep it small for quality sake. <laughs> yeah, we keep it small because we're over the quality, the quantity of the conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm interested to know more about Asia Pacific Youth uh, because whenever we talk about youth, usually we say it in general, either within our nation or globally. But is there any particular challenges? I mean, you have been uh, part of the regional. Um, Director for the World Youth Alliance for quite some time. Do you see any trends or any challenges that the Asia Pacific youth are facing that is unique from uh, youth from other regions? I think for Asia Pacific, um, it's both. I consider this as a as an advantage that there are many young people in Asia Pacific that I think more than 50% of the world's youth is located in the Asia-Pacific region. This is um, this is an opportunity for me because there are more young people who would like to um, do more in their own countries. But at the same time, if this potential of young people won't be developed and won't be harnessed towards greater development, then um, it might not lead to something that is that is not um, in line with the country, maybe, development. And in my work in the past one year and nine months in World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific, I have seen how young people are are very are very active. There's so much movement. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say that there's so much movement of young people in not only in their own re- in their own um, regions, but inter regions. I mean like for example Southeast Asia to East Asia, East Asia to the Pacific. And this movement of young people um is good because it makes young people understand that now we live in a global world and we need to go out of our countries to learn more, to meet more people and to work with them in solving the issues that we're working with um and make the national um level of our youth organizations become more global. And I think um this inclination towards a global mindset of young people is very important and it's present to some young people, to actually to many young people today. Um, but at the same time, um, there are still many young people in Asia Pacific who don't have this opportunity to probably become global or to learn more um, beyond the national border. Mm-hmm. And I think in the ELC, in the Emerging Leaders Conference, this is one of the key topics that we would like to discuss, like how can our education um, become global? And I think that's one of the things that we need to redefine in education, that when we are studying in our own countries, we should also have the chance to study um, maybe abroad, or we can have international students studying in our university, so that there's greater cultural understanding between um, young people from different um, backgrounds. And yeah, so there's so much movement, there's so much ideas, but I just hope that um, um, the, the other young people who are not involved in this particular process, for example, those who can't afford it or who don't have opportunities because they come from far-flung islands or in the mountains, will also be given opportunity. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Anyway, we'll take one short break. When we return, we'll discuss more about the programs and also agenda within the redefining education, uh, emerging young leaders. Uh, the Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Welcome back. And you are still with me as well as Lord Leoma Pomparada, Regional Director of the World Youth Alliance from the Asia Pacific region. So continuing our discussion on the Emerging Leaders Conference with the title Redefining Education, we want to dwell more on the program itself. Of course, earlier on, he discussed uh, about the programs uh, on on different areas that you will you will focus on especially on the area of education that is beyond classroom education um uh, lord i want to ask you about um your thoughts on education system itself do you think education system in the region of southeast asia is good enough to nurture uh leaders for the future of our region well, I think it's good, but 
I still believe that there's still so much potential that we can do, mm-hmm. especially in the in the coming um, integration in Southeast Asia. There is still a lot that we need to do to prepare young people mm-hmm. um, towards a more holistic and person-centered and more global education. Yeah, but what are the areas that we need to prepare for the young people? For the young people, well, I think um, it's important. Um, what well, one area that I'd like to start off is that we need to think of what are the possible um, programs mm-hmm. or innovative programs that we could offer young people um, for the future. I studied in an institution in Manila, wherein most of our programs or courses are innovative in a way because they're not the usual um, program areas that are being offered to young people when they enter college. And I think it's important for educational institutions to think of innovative programs that will not only help young people, but it will also help maybe young people discover more of their um, passion, but at the same time helping their countries. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of these programs, if you don't mind me sharing, is that (laughs) in my school, we have like... Um, diplomacy, for example, mm-hmm. we have a course on game design and development, courses that focuses on arts, on specific um, areas of arts. So I think mm-hmm. particular program areas and innovations, aside from the major offerings of the universities, should be developed. And mm-hmm. second, it's also important for um, universities and colleges to probably have more exchanges. Mm-hmm. Exchanges. Exchanges are usually, um, and right now you might say and feel that we already have exchanges happening um, around the world. But if you come to notice of it, these exchanges happen mostly in the cities, mm-hmm. usually in areas wherein young people have money, are privileged, who don't ha- have all these opportunities. And I think it's time that we move beyond the cities to mm-hmm. offer more opportunities because the ones who need it the most are the ones who are not receiving it as of the moment. These are young people who come from, um, um, as I've mentioned, from far-flung areas. And I think, um, of course, more than you might say, why don't we have why don't we have um, exchange programs to them? But these schools even don't have um, access airports or even um, other facilities that would help young people um, go to these areas. But I think that is another um, that is another area or another sector. But I think it's important that we try to um, rethink of the existing platforms of youth mm-hmm. engagement in the universities and encourage more participation from those who are coming from other provinces or other um, areas of the country who do not have access to this particular type of um, youth participation or engagement. Yeah, that's very good. In fact, this will uh, create or reduce um, structural barriers, uh, I suppose, on inequality, um, especially those living on the outskirts of city. They sometimes inequality is not so much about income inequality; it's about the structure itself. It doesn't create better access for people who are not part of the privileged group. I would say. And on the other mm-hmm. hand, <laughs> talking about reducing inequality, one of the areas that you actually would be di- will be discussing at the Emerging Leaders Conference is about entrepreneurship, especially social entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Tell us more about it. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, um, there's a recent study that we've discovered in Southeast Asia by another youth organization that tells us that young people within, I think, 20 to 30 years um, a huge percentage, I think more than 50% of young people would like to start their own social entrepreneurship, like um, would like to, um, to explore this possibility of really starting their own business. Mm-hmm. And many of them, it's sad that only like 5 or 10% of them would like to start in the next 3 or 5 years because many of them are afraid of the, possi- of the risk that they're going to enter. And in this particular discussion during the conference, we hope to um, give them an opportunity to learn on what does it entail to really start on my own project, mm-hmm. on my own business. And why is it important for me to enter and to consider um, social entrepreneurship? 
and in this era of as I've mentioned, youth movement in the region, there are also many social entrepreneurs who are like um, suddenly um, spring around like um, in different um, communities. Yeah. It's actually very inspiring to see them, but at the same time, um, some of them tell me stories that they're facing many challenges, especially in the um, in some aspects of government support mm-hmm. or funding, and I think. Of course, that's a different issue. But we start on like the first level of young people understanding on what really it means to um, having this particular idea on social entrepreneurship. So we're also having a speaker coming from um, a foundation in the Philippines who has been closely working with social entrepreneurs from different um, backgrounds, from different um, communities. And we're also having a speaker from Singapore who's going to talk on a project that they started that is uh, related to social entrepreneurship and education, not only in their country, but even in in the region. So we're very excited to hear their story. Yeah, that's very great. I think social entrepreneurship is definitely a trend that should stay (laughs) for a long while. Uh, And even in Malaysia, uh, social entrepreneurship has become one of the key area that young people uh, love, I mean, would love to explore and or or already exploring it. And I think it's a great path for young people to focus on uh, entrepreneurship, but in in a way that it provides for the betterment of society in, in a way. Um, on the other hand, uh, you also discussed about uh, uh, policy and, the, I mean, success of education in policy and culture. And I like the word policy. That means, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in many ways, it's about how governments should adopt or adapt to the changes of society in order for education uh, uh, to be a successful area for its society to grow. Um, talking about government, right? Um, mm-hmm. Do you think the government uh, in Southeast Asia uh, should create major reform in its education? If yes, what kind of reform that they can at least start on? Uh, Earlier on, you did discuss about access to exchange programs by uh, those who are living in the rural or those who are living in the outskirts of cities. But what else that the government could do? Okay. Well, I think um, for most of... I think that may, actually first is that there are many countries who are also doing um, significant development, especially in the area of education. But at the same time, um, aside from having major changes, I think it's also important to have uh, a reviewer to go back on the existing progr- programs and projects that are currently doing. Is there a possibility of us, for example, developing these programs and making them more um, helpful to our students mm-hmm. rather than creating big changes? So I, I think... It's important first for us to review, for the government to review on maybe what are some of the best practices that have been happening in our country that you would like to um, re- review and develop mm-hmm. more. And if there are areas that we feel that we need like a major development, mm-hmm. then it can follow. I think it's important for countries, well, if I were to, of course, recommend something, I think it's important also for um, this schools and for different governments to have a particular platform where they can share share with each other the different um, breakout um, breakthrough success stories that they had in the terms in areas of education so that they can learn from each other and provide an opportunity for them to mm-hmm. share the successful policies and programs that they have implemented in their own countries. It can be done by the individual or the um, or the government or the school so that if this particular programs may be replicated in other communities or countries, it may be done so. Um, I understand that there's currently an organization doing this um, particular particular area, which is the Seon University Network, Mm -hmm. but I think there are only a few schools um, which are represented in the organization. Um, Hopefully, these participating schools or universities will also be able to bring, um, if not bring more organization, 
bring the opportunities of or what they learn to the other universities and colleges so that the learning is not only um, being applied by the few schools who are represented in the network or in the system, but by also the other universities or education, civil civil mm-hmm. society organizations um, regarding education so mm-hmm. that the existing successful policies and programs mm-hmm. could be further um, developed and enhanced should they consider it to be helpful in their own communities. So in other words, they need to do constant review of their blueprint and of course to collaborate. That's the word for it, collaboration. <laughs> yes. And the second and the last is, of course, it's important for them to think of the long term, like mm. long term plans for, for their, for their education um, area, like in 10 years, in 20 years, mm. how do we envision our educational system? In, in the Philippines, do you, in the yeah. Philippines, do you have, uh, like a five year blueprint or 10 year blueprint for education? <coughs> Um, I'm not very familiar, but previously, they ha- the Department of Education actually had this particular blueprint, but I'm not sure if what is the status, if it has been continued. But for some of the institutions in the Philippines and the government, they do have really a long-term plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, a 30 to 50 year plan on how they can improve their systems in the different areas of the institution. I mm-hmm. think they're was a plan for the Depart- Ministry of Education a few years ago, but I'm not really sure on what has been the update or the status of that particular plan. But it's really important to have the long-term plan so that um, we have like a more sustainable program of action. Oh, that's great. Anyway, we'll discuss more at the conference itself to do more exchanges mm, on the long-term plans of each of the governments in the Asia-Pacific. What have they done and what can we move beyond that? Anyway, we'll take another one short break. When we return, we will discuss more on the younger generation in Asia-Pacific as well as the Emerging Leaders Conference. Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. You're back with me again. And of course, with Lord Lerma from Barada, Regional Director for World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific. So we discussed a lot about the program, the teams, and the event itself, which will be in October uh, 15 to 17, 2015 in Manila. Anyway, uh, to discuss further about the younger generation today, especially in the era of selfie and social media, do you think... Uh, Real leadership among the younger generation to today still exists, and or do you think they are too pampered uh, to bother to even change the world or leading the future? What do you think about it? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a very interesting question, and I I don't believe that there is a poverty of real leadership because actually there is a lot. Young people today, they have a lot of opinion on different issues, okay? And they tell these issues, especially in social media, right? In one mm-hmm. click, um, different issues um, in the government, on their advocacies, or on, on particular topics that they're interested to talk about. But so they are, think, they, are, um, they are more outspoken in a way than their previous yeah, generation. They have a lot of they say a lot of things, um, but I think more than um, the things that they do online, of course, what matters most is what they do offline. Mm-hmm. For example, um, I think they can still do, um, of course, this um, sharing what they need in social media, but it's important that, for example, if you if there's something that you would like to, to propose to the government because there's something that um, we feel that needs to be changed. Rather than just putting up a status in your Facebook account, is there a particular portal um, wherein you can actually like share this idea mm-hmm. or inform the government of um, something that is good or bad in your area? Because in the Philippines, we have this certain portal. I just forgot the name of that website. Um, wherein you can actually like in Metro Manila, you can actually um, send in your complaints or other areas so that this particular group will forward it to the particular government oh, that's um, great. agency. Is yeah, it an app or a the, website? It's it's a website. Oh, okay. And they have been working from the past, I think, more than five years now, and it has, it has been very effective. For example, um, you're having a difficulty in opening a business in a city, so you say there that I had like um, one one day to fulfill like 
all the requirements. But maybe next year, maybe the system will be improved because the government now sees that people are actually um, telling them that these are some of the ideas that they are proposing. So, so I think it's important for us to. <coughs> social media is um, really plays a very important um, important role, but more than um, because it provides, of course, um, young people to. Um, integrate their ideas together and to really more on information dissemination but it's really like what we do more than sharing the information mm, okay so the idea that young people are too pampered today's young people are too pampered is actually <laughs> not true at all um well personally um i would believe that um they were not too pampered because of my experiences with these young people probably it will really depend on who, um each individual's experience but based on my own personal experience I would still feel that many of these young people um, still um, would like to change the world it's just that sometimes they don't know how sometimes they want to change a lot of things or sometimes they really don't have the particular opportunity on to change or to advocate to push through with their advocacy so so yeah yeah but you know there's one person that I know is trying hard to change the world is of course Lot Leung Kofarada <laughs> yourself. <laughs> I I want to give a mention about the Philippine Move Awards. Uh, you were nominated for the Global Mover category. Tell us more about it. Yes, that's right. So um, Rappler, it's an online news agency in the Philippines. They they have the search, which is the Philippine Move Awards, and we're in. They have five categories: the civic, creative, enter- enterprise, technology, and global categories. And I, um, they had like a open nomination um, in the whole country. And out of the 300 nominees, they selected three finalists, national finalists per category. Mm, okay, so and you, were, you are one of them. I was, yeah, I oh. was one of the finalists mm-hmm. under the global, um, global category. Global Mover category. Basically, the the category is a citizen of the world who has earned international acclaim for a noteworthy achievement, all while showcasing the Filipino spirit. And I was nominated because um, I'm the incoming president of World Youth Alliance, um, as the first um, Filipino and actually the first from um, from Asia Pacific who will assume the position. Mm-hmm. So um, it's actually um, very. It's really an honor to be because my two other finalists are top CEOs in the Philippines. One is an owner of um, a known um, brand, and the other is also a CEO of another non-government organization who is also working with the area of education. Is also actually one of our partners in some of our activities, and who will actually also speak. Um, they also send a representative to the conference. Um, mm-hmm. I'm inviting our audience, if it's not too much trouble for them, to visit the website of Rappler. That's www.rappler.com slash moveaward slash global mm-hmm. um, for them to cast their vote. Can you uh, mention it again? <laughs> for right, the website? So that's yeah. um, www.rappler, that's R-A-P-P-L-E-R dot com slash move award slash global mm-hmm. so you'll be able to view all the three candidates including Lord Pomperada <laughs> <laughs> yes and voting ends on September 20 yeah so yes uh, thank you in advance for your support and yes <laughs> yeah. thanks Arlene and before we end the show, I want to uh, go back to the Emerging Leaders Conference 2015, Redefining Education, Breaking Barriers and Empowering the Asia-Pacific Youth, which will be happening on October 15 to 17. Perhaps you can uh, share with us more information about uh, the event itself, what would happen throughout the day and who are the speakers and where, where it will be held and all that. All right. So the fourth World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific Emerging Leaders Conference will happen from October um, 17. Sorry, from October 15 to 17, and it's going to be at the Bayleaf Hotel in Intramuros in Manila. And the conference is open to young people ages 15 to 30 years old. The deadline has um, sadly um, expired yesterday, but in case there is still um, interested applicants. Please um, drop us an email at wya 
wyaap.conference at gmail.com. Let me repeat that. That's wyaap.conference at, um, g- um, at gmail.com. And if we still have available slots, we can um, consider accepting um, late applicants to the conference. And the conference is a special gathering of 100 to 120 young people from Asia-Pacific region. And this year, we're going to discuss education with our theme, like um, as what we've mentioned, redefining education, um, breaking barriers, empowering the Asia-Pacific youth. We've prepared an inspiring um, lineup of speakers. Um, most of them are young and dynamic speakers. We're going to share to young people on why is their need to redefine education, what are the areas um, that we need to um, study on and discuss, especially on social entrepreneurship, the success of education and policy and culture. And at the same time, we'll explore best practices that have been happening in the local, community, and international level in the area of education. Mm -hmm. So we're going to bring um, um, speakers in four plenary sessions And we're also going to discuss um, issues in two breakout sessions. Mm -hmm. So the first is on um, breaking the barriers. So having um, areas on like what we feel are usually marginalized in the area of education. So we're having speakers who will bring um, successful projects, especially those dealing with street children and out-of-school youth, women and girls, and children with special needs. Aside from that, we'll also have another breakout session who will dis- um, that will discuss innovations in the classroom and what are the things that young people need to learn for them to be maybe what we call successful in the future. So we're going to discuss financial education for the youth, digital learning and online education, and community immersion volunteering. And aside from that, we're also going to have a cultural night during the second evening Mm -hmm. of the conference. And it's special this year because we're also going to have the 10th birthday celebration of World Youth Alliance Asia Pacific. Wow. It will also happen on the second night. So, so it's very exciting. It's very special. So we're going to invite all of our previous alumni and our previous staff members to also attend the celebration um, the evening um, mm-hmm. that will also be attended by, of course, the conference attendees. I see. So if you would like to learn more about mm-hmm. the program, you can still visit the website. It's at wya.net slash AP, E-L-C. And aside from the conference, I'd like to invite um, young people to join World Youth Alliance as a member or as a friend. Our membership is for free. It's open to young people ages 10 to 30 years old. You just have to believe in the World Youth Alliance Charter that may be, find, that may be found online. Um, you can again visit the website at wya.net. And once you become a member, you get the chance to be invited in the many programs that we offer in Southeast Asia and around the world. Mm-hmm. So there. And with that, thank you very much a lot, Pamparada.